You need to unmute. Okay, hello. Welcome to another Zoom meeting and podcast of Here's Tom with the Weather, where we investigate the plethora of higher powers that populate the vast universe of 12-step recovery, where alcoholics riff out on step three and step 11, as prescribed by the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, who encourage us to find some kind of higher power, as long as it's not us. We speak to people with all manner of higher powers, from those who are atheists, Sufis, agnostics, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, followers of Islam, hermetics, paganists, non-duality. We interview the lot and we leave no stone unturned. It's our aim to promote understanding and open-mindedness so that alcoholics and addicts can find a higher power of their own to stay sober and carry the message. And we promote tolerance and empathy for folks who might have different spiritual practices or, or, or ideas than we do. And please remember that this is not an AA meeting. It's just a Q&A and we talk to different folks who have different ideas about the truth. Sometimes we talk to seekers, to gurus, people not necessarily in recovery, and sometimes we look behind the official story of AA, which is what we're going to do today. And today we're going to speak to William Shaberg. William, and a short bio of William, uh, Bill's a scholar and a rare book dealer based in Fairfield, Connecticut. His interest in the history of ideas led him to amass a large collection of first edition philosophy texts and inspired his first scholarly work, The Nietzsche Canon, a publication history and bibliography. Bill has delivered lectures on Nietzsche, William James and other philosophers with his mentor King Dykeman at his alma mater in Fairfield University. He served in the United States Air Force and ran a family printing business for over 30 years before retiring to commit more energy to his book selling business, Athena Rare Books. Bill's scholarly investigation into the authorship of Alcoholics Anonymous was an 11 year project. And just like his Nietzsche book, it began with a bibliographical confusion over the text pre-publication history and culminated in an unprecedented chronology of the so-called or the big book origin. Bill has been sober for 39 years. Welcome, Bill. That's a hell of an intro, mate. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. No worries. It's uh, very impressive. And uh, like I said, there's nothing Nietzsche wouldn't teach about the raising of the wrist. Uh -huh. One of my favorite, my favorite Monty Python quotes, uh, the philosopher's song. Right. Bill, let's get straight to it, mate. Um, can you um, just tell us a little bit about, you Just you touched on there, your interest in the big book and how that sparked you. you, you why did you decide to write the book that you wrote? Well, I'm a rare book dealer. I'm also a guy who lives in a world without any supernatural elements. So when Jim Burwell, the New York atheist, when his copy of the original manuscript of Muckleth printing came up for auction, we bought it. And uh, as a rare book dealer, I needed to know how many copies there were of that thing. That's a big deal. If there's 100, uh, if the value is different if there's 400. Bill Wilson always said 400. Anyhow, I. <clears throat> I finally got permission to go down into the archive. I know that the multilith printing cost 165 bucks, but I didn't know how many copies were done. And I went down to the archive looking for the invoice. Never found the invoice. Never found that. So I still don't know if it's 100, 200, 300, or 400 copies. But I started stumbling over a whole bunch of other materials in the archive. The people down there were really, really helpful with me. And uh, I kept finding things that didn't quite line up with the stories I've been telling for decades in Alcoholics Anonymous. So my, my research, which started in 1939, backed itself down. And I, uh, I just, I just, I amassed so much information that I thought was personally fascinating that my wife, the lady Sarah, thought was personally fascinating. And my friend, Kevin Hanlon, uh, an A historian, thought was personally fascinating. But the next thing you know, I mean, I'd already written one book, so I started just I started just putting it down on paper. And uh, nice. and what we got so, was, I mean, the first chapter of the book is called Challenging the Creation Myths. And then after that, there's 30 chapters. And each one of those chapters challenges at least one of the typical AA creation myth stories that have been, that I've been told for decades in Alcoholics mm -hmm. Anonymous. In our, um, we had a, we always do a pre-interview with all of our guests and you were, you were quite sure you, you were adamant that everything had been detailed and double checked. So all your sources and all the material that you, you researched, this detective, this amazing detective story that you've undertaken, everything was backed up by, by facts and, and it was, it was by your peers. Is that correct? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, as I was writing this stuff and it was in many cases contradictory, 
and we're talking alcoholics here, I knew I was going to have problems unless I could actually <laughs> document exactly where that stuff came from. So the book, the book turns out to be almost 800 pages long. And, uh, and it's got 416 informational footnotes. I hate looking in the back for information. So if there's an informational thing, it's at the bottom of the page. There's 416 of those. The citations, I'm like, you want to find out where I got this? The end notes, there's 1,570 end notes. So if you got a problem with, with the stuff I'm quoting and you think I'm misquoting it or misusing it, uh, one of the reasons that I put entire letters into the book rather than just excerpts from the letters is, I knew that if I just put in an excerpt, somebody would say, well, you just cherry picked that letter, dude. So I put the whole letter in the book. I mean, from beginning to end, the letters are in, are in the book in their entirety. I, I don't mean to say that I've got all the information and I don't mean to say that my interpretation is always 100% correct. There's a couple of places in the book where I say, I'm not sure I got this right. If you got a better opinion, I'd like to hear it. But it's documented. Yes. Okay. It's a scholarly work. Okay. That's that's my point, and thank you for answering that. And um, I just want to take this opportunity as well to thank um, Joe C uh, for for getting you along here. It's a, it's such an honour to have you here and um, to have this information. So big big tip off to Joe, who's a, a panelist and a, a great friend of this show. So thank you very much to Joe C. He's a top geezer, as is Anne K, who always helps me out here. So let's get back to it there, mate. So it's science. You've got there's a, there's science behind it. Everything's backed up. And I just want to, I'm not, I'm a guy who's read the book, big book a few times, and so I'm no way am I a big book uh, thumper, but I've heard stories along the way um, about how it was written. Now, do we just clear it up? Who, who wrote the big book? Was it the, there was the first hundred that had their input? Was it Bill? Was it Dr. Bob? Was it Lois? Who, who wrote the book and what was the impetus behind writing the book? Well, that's what my, my whole book is about. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Bill, Bill Wilson wrote the book. Bill Wilson wrote okay. the book. Except on his own. For, except for the chapter, I'm talking about the first 164 pages. Sure. Bill sure. Wilson wrote the first 164 pages, except for the chapter to employers, which was written by his right hand man, Hank Parkhurst. And uh, and no, it wasn't a hundred guys. First of all, there wasn't a hundred guys when the book was published. Bill was always inflating the numbers and and uh Ruth Hawk is really on him a number of times about how in, how inflationary he could be with the numbers. He was always rounding things up. So there was there was let's just say there was a hundred. There wasn't a hundred. And if there was a hundred, there was supposed to be sixty people in Akron and forty people in New York. That's also a made up urban legend kind of number, but I'm going to go with it because that's what people say. Well, the sixty people in Akron had zero, nothing to do with the front writing of the first 164 pages. Nothing substantive whatsoever. So now we're down to 40 people in New York. And uh, <clears throat> there really wasn't 40 people. And I, I mean, let's, you know, these, Bill wrote the thing and he would go into meetings and read it to them. And I got this wonderful quote from a guy who was there in December of 1938 when Bill was reading from chapters five and six. And he said that the comments were, uh, put a comma in there and maybe that should be a question. And, and, and you know, it was it, it was minor minor stuff. I mean, the, the urban legends in AA that were that we uh, that, that you know they 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 fought and bled their way through every paragraph, through every sentence, through every word. At times, Jimmy Burwell says, you know, there's all these AA lawyers we had to satisfy, and we just fought tooth and nail over this thing. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Where it happened was it did happen, but it didn't happen in Akron, and it didn't happen in the New York meetings at Brooklyn. It happened over in Newark at Hank Parker's Honor Dealer's office where Bill was working with Ruth Hawk. And that was Bill and Ruth and Hank Parker's. Uh, by the way, Jimmy Burwell, the atheist, was living in, Jim, in, in Hank's house at the time. So he was cranking Hank up and sending him in to uh, tone down the religious stuff. And Fitz Mayo, who uh, was out of Maryland, he was the second guy Bill got sober in New York permanently. And Fitz Mayo, was, uh, he wanted a real Christian book. So, so the battles were, were, were in, in Hank's office in Newark, New Jersey. And they were some, there, was some, there was some blood on the floor there, I bet you. But uh, Hank was a, he wasn't just a type A guy. He was a triple type A guy. And, uh, and Fitz was kind of a male. Uh, he was kind of like a milk toast, you know? It was, it was a no contest deal. I think Bill just stepped back and, and let it happen. Okay, so he, he let the, the brawl happen and he just stood back and waited till the dust settled and then claimed victory. 
Well, yeah, I he guess. always said he was going to be the umpire. He said they, they let him be the up to umpire. You know, he said, and, and great quote, he said at one point, he said, listen, I was the umpire. Well, it sounds like he just he just took all these ideas and just kind of, no. He said they were disagreeing with him. So they find, he finally got him to agree that if he listened carefully to them, that he could decide what was going to go in the book and not. Now, clearly, the implication of that is they didn't think he was paying attention to him. So no. Wilson, Wilson, Wilson wrote that book. And, okay. and he wrote that book based on his own experience primarily. I mean, he took other people's experience, but primarily the experience described in that book from Bill's story on is Bill Wilson's personal experience. Because um, AA, the founders of AA is supposed to be Bill W. and Dr. Bob. What was So Dr. Bob had no involvement whatsoever in the writing of the big book? <clears throat> David, I don't think we want to go off on my co-founder talk here. Uh, okay. I, I, have, I have real problems with the whole co-founder thing. I mean, uh, one of the presentations I've been doing lately is uh, is Henry G. Parkhurst, the co-founder who drank. Now, now, I just mentioned Parkhurst. He was Bill's right-hand man in New York. Without Henry Parkhurst, we wouldn't have a book. Uh, one of the things I say in every presentation I've done since this book was published is no Hank, no book. And, uh, wow. and Hank was the guy who was, who was really responsible for lighting a fire under Bill's butt to get him going, first mm -hmm. in May of 1938 and then in September of 1938. Uh, and he was always arguing with Bill what should and shouldn't go into the book. Uh, Bob, uh, Bill's writing letters back to Bob after he sends the chapters out. He says, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you like them, but I'm looking for some criticism here. I'm looking for some input. You people are giving me nothing. And mm -hmm. twice later, he said, you know, the, that what he got from, uh, from Akron was the warmest regards or something. You know, it was just, it was just damnation with faint praise. Um, right. Oh, okay. the co-founder, co you're talking about the co-founder thing. No. I, I personally think Bill Wilson was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then, you know, Bill had an ego problem. I mean, you almost by, if you, if you show up at AA, you almost by definition have an ego problem, but we won't go there. And he was really always trying to take the spotlight off himself because, because when the book came out and, and people really started getting sober, when lives started being saved, those people just started worshiping Bill Wilson. They just thought he was, that's, that's the guy who saved my life. I mean, I have no idea. How, how stupid my reaction would be if Bill Wilson walked in the door right now. Holy, I mean, good God. Uh, mm. as, I, as I said on Bill one time, without him, I'd be a dead man. I would have been dead by the time I was 40. Mm. You know, so, so Bill was taking the spotlight off himself by spreading, you know, Dr. Bob. The first, first instance I can find of New York acknowledging Dr. Bob as a co-founder is 1945 in the Great Pot. There's some stuff from 1942 in, in Ohio they were lobbying to make Bob the co-founder. Um, and then, of course, Bill says, you know, William James was a co-founder, and Shoe, Sam Shoemaker was a co-founder, and, and Dr. Silkworth was a co-founder, and Sister Ignatia was a co-founder, and, okay. you know. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, like I say, the book's available there as well. Just so you, just if you go to um, Bill's uh, website there, he's writing, it's www.writingthebigbook. Dot com. I want to go back to that individual you said who was um, the real, you, we, we spoke about, is it William, the, the guy who was the impetus behind, who, who nudged Bill along? He, he was the guy who sort of motivated Bill because I think from what we spoke about, Bill took a while to sort of get pen to paper or get on the typewriter. There was, he needed motivation. Is that, is that right? Am I right in thinking that? Yeah, completely, completely. So, I mean, the timeline on the story is, they, they have a meeting in Akron in October of 1937, and they, they, they vote narrowly to approve Bill Wilson's plan to have a chain of national hospitals for alcoholics, paid missionaries, and a book. And uh, they tell Bill that they're not going to give him a dime for any of those projects, but if he goes back to New York and raises the money, maybe it'll be okay. So Bill goes back to New York, and he works on that project, and he works with uh, some people very, very, very close to John D. Rockefeller Jr., the richest man in the world, who has been given money to temperance things for two generations. And, uh, and, and he starts doing that stuff. But they're not raising any money, not raising any money, not raising any money. Finally, in, in May of 1938, Hank, Hank his right-hand man, who is his big promotional guy, these two guys are the guys going around trying to talk to people about giving them money. And, and Hank says, listen, Bill, what we really need here is two chapters of this book we keep talking about. If we had two chapters of the book that we could show these people the how serious this is, 
we could raise some money. So I, I, I just, I need two chapters of the book. So Bill writes, there is a solution, chapter number one, and Bill's story, chapter number two. And he writes those May into the first week of June, 1938, and they start sending them out in the middle of June, 1938. Um, but he doesn't write anything for three and a half months after that. It, it, it's uh, it's uh, not until that, and they also don't raise any money, by the way, that Hank's, <laughs> Hank's, Hank's promotional plan did not result in, uh, get the results he was looking for. So uh, in uh, in September, uh, there's there's this, there's this, this magazine called This Week, that's a Sunday supplement magazine, goes in newspapers all across the country, five million copies in circulation. And Hank, that's a guy on the inside who's going to write a story about AA. And in the story, he wants the guy to write, listen, if you send us one dollar, we'll send you chapters out of this book that we're going to we're going to finish and get done. And uh, and so he goes to Bill Wilson and he says to Bill Wilson, listen, two chapters don't cut it for a buck. We need five chapters. I need five chapters. So. So Bill starts writing again on September 15th, and he writes from September 15th to the end of December. Three and a half months, he wrote the rest of that book. He wrote the rest of that book. And, wow. uh, and once, once he took the bit in his teeth, he, he, he ran with it. He really did run with it. Mm. This, the Hank, like you said, it was um, seems like a very interesting character. What was his? Can you tell us a bit about Frank? Frank uh, sorry, Hank, and what his background was. Was he in sales? Was he in marketing? What, yeah, he, what, was sales. he was a big deal in. Uh, he was a big deal in um, Standard Oil. He had a whole bunch of jobs in Standard Oil. Uh, I, I run through his whole resume when I do this presentation on Hank online, and uh, he just he got fired from a job for drinking. And, and, and in one place, uh, one of the guys, there was the very first publicity about Alcoholics Anonymous uh, came in a, a newspaper article that was written about Hank in, in January of 1939. And in that, the guy who wrote it uh, said that he had made $40,000 a year before he got fired. Elsewhere, Bill says he made $20,000 a year. Now, even if it's only $20,000 $20, a year in 1935, mm. it was a blowload of money. We're talking the depths of the depression and this guy's making 20 grand a year. You know, if you were making 1500 a year, you were doing well in those days. So, so he was, he was that kind of a guy. So he gets, he gets, uh, he gets fired and Bill picks him up in, uh, in a town's hospital. And, uh, and they really gone, they were just joined at the hip for four years after that. And they're, so they're doing this and doing this. And he's always, always, always pushing Bill. He's always arguing with Bill. Bill wants a religious book. Hank wants, a, a psychological book. What he means by that, he wants moral psychology in there, which is something that Dr. Silkworth developed that whole idea. That's what he's looking for. Hank basically gets dropped out of the story. Why does he get dropped out of the story? I mean, he mentioned, he's mentioned a couple of times in A Comes of Age in passing. Bill could not write him out of the story. He was way too important to it. But the fact of the matter was, six months after the book's published, in April of 1939, Hank Parker's is drunk. And he, and, he, and, he, and he stays drunk until he dies in 1954, off and on. So, you know, it, it, it's a bad story for you to say the second most important guy in the writing of the book, oh, yeah, that guy, he drank. He drank. Yeah. So you don't do that. It's a bad sales, it's a bad sales pitch. And Wilson mm -hmm. was, in fact, a great salesman. Yeah, obviously, it sounds great. Um, yes, he was. He was a remarkable man, as we know. And just to say to everyone as well, this, you know, what you're hearing here is I recommend you go and do the research yourself as well and follow in Bill's, um, I was going to ask Bill about that actually, and follow in Bill's footsteps or buy his book and, and make your own judgment. Just don't take it off this particular podcast or this particular uh, meet, Zoom meeting. Just go and have a look for yourself as well for the facts because facts are really important. And I'm, like I say, I'm very grateful that Bill's come along here. Um, in your investigations, did you get the sense that people had done this investigation before you? Were there, were there any sort of fingerprints? And I'm not saying there's a conspiracy, but was there anything? Did you get the feeling perhaps that somebody had looked into this before? Like you talk about, it's not a great story that Hank is acknowledged. You know, Hank was was essentially cut out because of that. Would you, did you get a feeling that that might have been, there was a sort of a conspiracy involved with that? I'm, I'm not a conspiracy guy on almost any level and certainly not here. I don't think there was any conspiracy. You know, there's this, there's this, uh, Urban legend in AA that that that, that 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 they keep everything secret at GSO archive, you know, and that is really not the case. It is not mm -hmm. the case. 
the first time I applied to GSO, <clears throat> I, 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 there was there was some sort of I never heard back from them. So I, I thought they had denied me. I believe the legend. And right. then, uh, then several years later, six years later, I uh, I ran into the archivist and I, I I said, geez, I'd be really. She was asking me a whole bunch of questions. She said, you know a lot about this. I said, know a lot more about this if I could get into the archive. I didn't know she was the archivist. And she asked <laughs> me what was going on, and I told her, and she said, you send me an application, I'll get you in. So I've been I've been going to the archive since uh, 2007. Um, and uh, and I'm still kind of working off that original supposedly only six month thing. No, there's all kinds of stuff in there. But has anybody done done a deep dive into it the way I've done before? No, no, nobody has. Okay. And I don't think there's anything. You know, everybody mm -hmm. thinks I. You know, they, people just accept the stories that Bill Wilson told. Them. They just, I mean, he's Bill Wilson, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. But Bill, Whit mm -hmm. Bill Wilson was not telling historical facts. He wasn't trying to tell his about historical facts you can't expect him to tell his bill wilson is a salesman trying to sell life-saving sobriety to people who are drunk and it and it, it says in pass it on there's like in three great quotes i use in my presentation where they say bill was always a little flexible with the facts bill always told the parable if he thought it would do any good you know he was he he, he mythologized stuff he he, he he boiled things down to to stories that made a point. They weren't necessarily true on factual details. But when I'm going through documents that are written in 1937 and 1938, 1938, this is what people are saying. You know, I mean, that, that I, I can see what's actually going on here. You know, it's a little stupid thing. Bill says that they, you know, when they when they made the company Works Publication Company, that they went to a stationery store and Hank bought some, and he wrote in Works Publication. Well, no. No, the company was called 100, 100 Men until February 18th is the first time the name Works Publication comes up. And they're writing stock certificates in the previous October. So is, is that a big deal? No, no. Does Bill want to tell the story about, well, we went there and Hank wrote 100 Men on it, but we changed the name later? No, it's too confusing. But he just smoothed those stories out so that they, so that they had impact that he was looking for, trying to get people's attention and get them to try this suggested program of recovery to 12 steps. Okay, it looks like Dave may have lost his internet connection. I think so. Here he comes, here he comes. Let me find him. Dave, you're back. Let me find him. Hi. Hi. Ah, sorry. 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 Whoa. Whoa, you guys. Hang on a minute. Sorry about that. Whoa. I'm here. I'm going to bring him up. Okay. I think John needs to keep walking. There you go. Um, it's all right. I got it. You sure? Yeah, yeah, fine. So, um, sorry about that, everyone. I'm listening to uh, the Jimi Hendrix feedback uh, special there. Um, you told a really great story to me with regards to the Ebony uh, Finding Religion. You have to turn that down. Oh. Sorry. Um, um, you told me a great story about the Ebony Thatcher Finding Religion story, and I uh, was um, very interested to hear. Uh, what you found out about that. I think you said that you um, spoke to Ebby. You spoke to Lois about it. Is that true? No, no, I didn't speak to any of those people. Those people were all dead by the time I started doing this research. Uh, <clears throat> but I, you know, when you're doing this kind of historical research, you're looking for um, confirming opinions. So, I mean, everybody knows the story that Bill tells in Bill's story. I mean, if you've read the big book, it's the first chapter you stumble over. It's the first thing that happens. Bill's still drinking. The phone rings, he goes, picks it up. It's his good friend, Ebby. He invites Ebby over. He thinks they're going to drink a little bit. Ebby doesn't want to drink. He refuses. And Ebby tells him he's got religion and he's got sober. And Bill th says, you know, well, I don't know what you got, kid, but it's uh, it's something I could definitely use. So, Ebby, I've got three recordings of Ebby telling that story uh, of him going over there. 
and uh, and he was actually he actually told one of those stories um, and knew it was being recorded when, when Bill was in the audience. And Evie says, so here's here's Evie's story. He calls up and Lois answers the phone, and they make a date for Evie to come over a couple of nights later. I'm sure that he told it. Uh, Lois, that what was going on and what he was going to do here, and she thought, yeah, Bill could Bill could use somebody telling him how to stop drinking. So she invites him over for dinner, and he comes up for dinner, and nobody's there but uh, Mr. Green. Now, Mr. Green is a is a black servant that worked for her father, was a family servant who lived in the basement at 182 Clinton Street with with uh, with the Wilsons, and he's the only one home. Abby knew Mr. Green. Mr. Green lets him in. Bill shows up. Lois shows up. Bill's been drinking. Um, <clears throat> they have dinner. They have dinner. Bill, Abby, Lois. Oh, and the woman who, who they've rented the top floor of the brownstone to because they need the money, she gets invited down uh, for dinner. So the four of them have dinner. And after dinner, they go up to the second floor to the parlor. And Lois says to Abby, so Abby, why don't you tell us what's going on with you? And Abby starts talking and he talks for a couple of hours about the Oxford group and how he got sober and how this thing is working. And, uh, and after he gets finished, he, he's got to leave to catch the last subway home. Bill walks him to the subway, puts his arm around him and says, I'm, boy, I don't, I don't, whatever you got, kid, I could really use a part of that. But of course, Bill kept drinking for a couple of weeks, at least after that. So when he tells a story, he says, says look, a uh, couple of things here. He says, first of all, I know that's the story. That's not the story that you're familiar with. But you got to remember one thing. You got to remember one of us was drunk that night. And one of us was sober for starters. You got to remember that. And the other thing you got to remember is that is that 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 the point of the story, of my story, my version of the story, and the Bill Wilson's version of the story is exactly the same. A message of recovery can be carried best when one alcoholic talks to another alcoholic. So I, I struggled really, really hard trying to figure out what the devil, I mean, how could he have told, Bill Wilson called that story of Evie coming over the bedtime story. It was the one that everybody wanted to hear every single time he talked. And he told that story over and over and over and over and over. How could he have told that story if it wasn't even close to the truth? Well, again, I'm back to the fact that Bill was, a, a, a he's telling a parable and he's, he's mythologizing this thing. He's, mm -hmm. he's trying to clean it up and make it sharp and clear. If you listen to Bill's story, you know exactly what the message is. The message of that story is that, the, that, the, that recovery can be carried best when one alcoholic talks to another alcoholic. If you get Lois in there, you get Mr. Green in there, you get the woman upstairs in there, you know, it just, it just, it confuses, it distracts from the point of the story. So Bill told the story that had some impact to it and some focus to it, and that delivered the message that he was trying to deliver. And it was, it was, the, it was what he did with stories over and over and over and over again. You know, he just couldn't complicate things with all the, all the messy details. Um, if you did, people had missed the point. Uh, there's yeah. a, there's, there's also a, a letter that Lois wrote um, a couple of months later. Um, mm. and, and she basically says, you know, Abby came over. She says, Abby came over in December. Now, Bill always said she came over in late November. So there's a little confusion there. We're just a couple of months away from this thing actually happening. And we got we got date confusion, you know. Um, but, but she basically said, you know, Bill got sober. This guy came over and, and explained. Uh, and Bill's gotten sober in the Oxford group. She tells us almost nothing about Abby's visit itself, except that he, that, and he came over and, and, and told Bill about this. And then Bill ran with that ball and he's been staying sober ever since. That's a, I think that's a February 1935 letter. Bill got sober in December 1934. So, so the, but, but I, I start off the book with that. So it's the first story I tell in the challenging the creation myth chapter. Because it's a perfect example of what, what Bill was doing, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and how you have to approach his material if, in fact, you think um, mm -hmm. you're, you're getting historical fact here. I mm -hmm. mean, then he goes out and he gets Dr. Bob Silver. We're not going to get into the argument about what date that was, June 10th or June 17th. But anyhow, then in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, was it, is it the forward? Or the I, he talks about them going and, and, and the very next guy they approached, he says, they got sober. That was AA number three. That would be Bill Dotson, the man on the bed. You know, Bill Dotson wasn't the first guy they went to. They had a couple, at least two guys we know of who they tried to get sober and didn't get sober. So, but, but, 
But Bill Wilson doesn't say, well, you know, Bill Dodson was really the third guy. You know, I mean, we, we had a couple of failures and then we figured out how to do it. And we did this and this guy actually took it. Did... No, no. What's, mm -hmm. what's the point of Bill's story saying the very first guy we got to heard the message and stopped mm -hmm. drinking and has stayed sober ever since? Not mm -hmm. only does it mean that one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic can successfully deliver the message, but that it's sustainable over more than just one, two or two people. Now we got a third guy. Hmm. That's the point of that story. Hmm. It's, it's interesting. Um, just through what you're saying, some of it, I guess, and and this is only my take on it, that some people might say, and I'm starting to sound like a, a certain news channel host. Some people might say um, that that you might be, Are you? do you feel sometimes that you might be, or have you been accused of undermining the validity of the big book by by demystifying this by demystifying the creation myths like this is there a danger in it do you think or is it is it important of the work that you're doing well there's a there's a lot of questions in there david and a lot of ways i could come at that i i don't hmm. i don't think it undermines the credibility of the book i mean the message of the book has been the the the, the credibility of the message of the book has been proven by millions and millions and millions yeah. of people i mean bill wilson Bill, Dr. Bob may have been a believer, but Bill Wilson was a pragmatist. He was he was a guy who believed in results. And, and, and the stuff that he put in the book was, was the results that he had seen, not only in his own life, but in other people's lives. But you know, the, the no, no, I don't I don't think it okay. I think I think bringing some sort of credit, one of the things I would try and emphasize is 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 the culture and the context. Ernie Kurtz, uh, who wrote Not God, was just a great mentor to me. And he would always beat me over the head about context. You got to make sure you understand the context. Well, the context is 1938, United States of America. We're still at the tail end of the Depression here. These guys are all white guys. They're all in their 40s. They've all, they're all Protestants. They're all, you know, they're all businessmen. And, and, and they're writing this book. So let's pay attention to that. Let's, let's pay attention mm -hmm. to, 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 to where this thing is coming from. But I... One of the things that came out to me clearly after all my years in AA, re re doing the research on this book, is my understanding of the basic, absolutely rock bottom, basic foundational principles or, or premises of Alcoholics Anonymous are two things. Number one, an analysis of the problem. If you're a real alcoholic, you have no defense against the first drink. None. <laughs> Blank mental blank spots, blah, 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 plain insanity, blah, 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 blah. No defense against primary, no defense against the first drink. First premise. Second premise. Oh, there is one thing you can do to put between you and the first drink. One thing that we've ever seen that absolutely works for us, and that is to get a vital spiritual experience. And if you can get your hands on a vital spiritual experience and keep it alive in your life, it's a good thing. Good, good chance it's going to keep you away from picking up that first drink that you have no defense. That, that's the only defense you're ever going to have for a first drink. Now, in my opinion, everything else is exposition of those two particular things. And I think Bill Wilson's genius is in this analysis of the problem that an alcoholic with no booze in his body whatsoever, and no matter how many promises he's made to himself and his wife and his boss and his kids and his mother and his father, everybody else, no booze in his body. He's going to have this strange mental blank spot and he's going to pick up a drink. If you're a real alcoholic and you're just stone cold sober, you're still going to pick up a drink. No hope for you. Unless you get a Bible spiritual experience. And I Whatever think the book, that might be. book does a hell of a job of explaining that. If you look, if you if you read the black part, you know, not between the lines, you read the black part. <laughs> Boom. Fantastic. Um, so the, just to remind everyone here um, that we do take questions. If you want to send uh, your questions in chat to myself, Anne or Joe um, or E&G, um, send your questions to me and I'll ask them. Um, but we have got one that actually kicks off a story that you mentioned the other day. Um, I think um, you mentioned about uh, Bill and Lois and a story about going to see Hank one day. But uh, Becky oh, yeah. asked. Yeah. This, this, is, this might tie into it. Becky asked, which is a great question. Becky uh, from Nova Scotia, I think it is, um, is a great friend of this uh, this program. Her question is, was it the wives who helped to write the section Two Wives in the Big Book? And if you can build in that story with it. That's an interesting question. Good question, Becky. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, David, I'm going to, I'll start with David and now I'll get to this. I, I'm, I'm going through Lois's diary. And um, I just told you, he wrote two chapters and they started sending them out on June 17th, June 24th or something like that. Just a few days later, Lois's diary says, Bill and I had a fight and he ran out and told me he was going to go drink. And then somewhere else, she says exactly the same thing. He told me he was going to drink, except rather than drinking, he went over to Hank Parker's house in New Jersey and stayed sober. So, I, I mean, I always I always think, you know, we, there's, there's about 10 or 12 major times where the future of Alcoholics Anonymous just teetered in the balance. And it, this, this particular day in June of 1938, if Bill Wilson had a drink that day, we would not be on this Zoom call talking to each other. I wouldn't have had a book to write. I probably wouldn't even be alive to write a book. So I, I, I always say thank you, Hank, for keeping that very thirsty founder of Alcoholics Anonymous sober that day. And I also wonder about what kind of marital advice Hank was giving him because Hank was being divorced a year later. So uh, there's that. <laughs> Now, now, as to the two wives, Bill Wilson wrote two wives. Bill Wilson wrote two wives. Lois had okay. nothing to do with it. Lois was, there's an interview with, with Lois uh, that she did, uh, I, I don't know, you know, like uh, 1975 or something. And she was still pissed that Bill didn't let her write that thing. Talk about <clears throat> resentments, but we're not going to go there. Anyhow, she was still angry at Bill Wilson that he wouldn't let her do that. And, uh, and just as a corollary, there's, this, there's, there's an urban legend in AA that she was angry because Bill had offered that chapter to Ann Smith, Dr. Bob's wife, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Bob's wife, Ann, turned it down. Uh, that's not true either. Uh, he did not offer two wives to Ann Smith. He offered to Ann Smith that she could write a chapter in the back of the book that was going to be called The Alcoholic's Wife or An Alcoholic's Wife. And Ann didn't want to do that. Uh, she, she, she demurred. So uh, that story was written. It's in the first edition uh, issue of the book. Uh, it's called An Alcoholic's Life. It was written by Marie Bray, uh, one of the wives. And uh, that's as close as uh, Anne ever got to that. Now, Bill, Bill uh, you know, what he was really worried about, I think, certainly one of the things he wanted was, was for the writing style to be uniform. And, 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 and he didn't want to didn't want to let other people be interjecting all kinds of different styles. I also think he was really worried about what what uh, what Lois would write. Um, no. you know, one of the things they struggled with mightily, uh, he and Hank, I mean, over and over again, they were looking for a soundbite definition of an alcoholic. And one of the things that happens in that chapter of the family afterwards, they talk about the four types of alcoholics, you know, and earlier in the book, we talk about the three types of alcoholics. They could never get a soundbite definition of what an alcoholic was. It was a big challenge for the lawyer who, who drew up the legal documents for the Alcoholic Foundation. He didn't figure out how to say it, so he he weaseled around it. But I think he was really worried that 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 uh, that Lois just wasn't going to deliver the message that he wanted to deliver. And certainly, Lois, I doubt, would ever have delivered the message. That's the end of that thing about the guy who what is it? He 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 quit smoking or something, and and his yeah. wife starts bitching at him, you know. And so because his wife was bitching at him, he drank. I mean, Lois, I'm. That's a Bill Wilson story. That's not a Lois Wilson story, in my opinion, my understanding of those people. So mm. Bill wrote that chapter and he also wrote uh, the family afterwards. He wrote the whole thing. The only thing he didn't write was to, uh, was to employers. Okay, that's, um, I do, yeah, because the, 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 you're opening up another thing there, which I want to talk about later on. And we will talk about the, um, the, the, the future versions of the big book, but I'm going to go to my co-panelist here, Josie. Uh, the mighty Josie, who's uh, brought you along here. So, Joe, uh, you've got a question. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the order? Uh, because uh, the impression is given in AA Comes of Age is that it was written chronologically. But can you talk about how uh, working with others and a vision for you was written without any concept of what the 12 steps were? And then, uh, so how that was sort of a 11th hour thing coming up with the steps. And then from there, if you wanna to go to the six step myth or the influence the editors had on how the book was put together. Well, the, the chronology, uh, as, as you say, is interesting. Bill, said, Bill says in A Comes of Age that he wrote it chronologically. You know, they wrote, they wrote his story, they were, they did a, there was a solution more about alcoholism, we agnostics, and now it was time for chapter five. No, that's not how it worked. He wrote all the chapters, but chapter five and six, 
those are the last two chapters he wrote. Uh, he had already written uh, working with others. It was it was the big deal. That's how they stayed sober. Was working with others more than anything else. And uh, and and he's written a vision for you. It's kind of a vision for you is kind of a sop for those Ohio people that didn't want anything to do with the program because it because if you read it, it's all about what happened in Ohio. It's all like you guys are doing such a great job out there, you know. And um, but so he writes two chapters in May and early June of 38. He starts writing the 12 steps, supposedly, according to Lois's diaries, uh, in early December of 1938. And of course, you can't write chapter five and six until you've got 12 steps. So he writes the 12 steps in the beginning of December. Um, there's all kinds of things about that that were problematic. Bill's story about writing the 12 steps is are hugely problematic. I, I, was, I was shocked how much trouble I had making sense out of that and writing that chapter. Uh, and, and so then he does five and six. Uh, and, and, and as soon as they finish five and six, they're done. They give it, to the, give it to the first editors. And the first editors were a guy named Tom Usel. Uh, he was kind of a high priced, expensive, uh, well-known, famous guy who, who was a, an editor. <clears throat> he did kind of a meta approach to it. And a woman named Janet Blair, who's never gotten any credit as far as I know until my book was written, and she did really the text. She did all kinds of really cool changes to the text. Now, of course, Bill Wilson was changing the text also all the way along. The first version of There is a Solution, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but, but they whacked out, whatever the word count is, they whacked out 37% of the words before it got published. So there's big changes going on all the time that Ruth Hawk was retyping these chapters to be sent out, those first two chapters, to be sent out as promotional things. There was no Xerox machine in those days, folks. No, uh, no uh, 914 Xerox machine until 1959, as a matter of fact. So there was no easy way to do that. You just had to retype stuff. So anyhow, the, the, the editor, the big guy, Tom Usel, he makes the, the biggest change. He takes Bill's story, which is the first story in the back, and moves it to the very front of the book. He insisted mm -hmm. the book needed to open with a with a real life testimonial to get credibility with a with a, a, an alcoholic reader, and uh, and they he did that. So that 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 was that. There was a whole bunch of other changes made that have been uh, kind of documented. And again, I try and report on those things in the book and show the differences in the stories. The problem is we don't have original versions of any stories except for Bill's story, and also for uh, there is a solution. There's no real uh, earlier typings of the rest of the chapters until we get the multilith printing in mid-February 1939. But, uh, but there's a bunch of, you know, I've got things where I track on how, I, I, think there's, I think there's three versions or four versions of There Is a Solution in the two archives, New York City and Stepping Stones. And the changes are just, just cool to watch how he's putting words in and taking things out and making changes. Um, Joe, there was another part of that question, but I've already lost it because I'm an old guy. I can't remember anything for more than 60 seconds. Oh, the uh, <laughs> the six step myth. Uh, yeah, well, that was that was really the big problem with with Bill's version of the story. Bill telling this, telling that Bill says Bill's the famous story, right? I mean, told this story over and over again. Where did the 12 steps come from? Well, you know, we got to the point where we had to write. I knew I had to write this chapter, and I had to had to had to write. A set of rules, he didn't call them rules, I had to write a set of steps that, that, that they couldn't weasel out of. And we, we had this six step word of mouth program. So I went upstairs and I laid down on the bed and I was having one of my imaginary ulcer attacks and I mean, feeling too stressed. I took out a yellow pad and I started, I just, I broke down the six steps into these things and I numbered them and it turned out there were 12 and that, how wonderful was that? And I went downstairs and I showed them a couple of guys and they didn't like them. That's Bill's story. Ah, oh, man, I started. I thought, this is great. You know, he, he told that story a bunch of times. I'm just going to basically take those things and package them together, make sure I've got the little details from that one and the little details from this one and details from that, and just kind of weave them into one story based exactly on what Bill Wilson said, uh, which, I, which I did, but it didn't make, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. This whole like, so I go look at it. When's the first time Bill Wilson told the story of going upstairs and laying down on the bed and writing the 12 steps? December of 1949. 
11 years. I mean, if there's an earlier one, please tell me about it. I'd love to find it. 11 years afterwards, he tells his story and he tells it to Jack Alexander, who's going to write, who wrote the famous story in the Saturday Evening Post. Jack's going to write another story and Bill writes him a long letter with a whole bunch of stuff. The first time he mentions the six steps is at a psychiatric convention in Montreal in May of 1949. It's the first time he mentions the six steps. May of 1949, we're talking, we're, we're, we're talking 10 and a half years after the event. It's the very first time. So then I'm, I'm like, I'm really struggling with this. It's like, dude, why, why, nobody else asked you how the 12 steps came about before 10, for, the, for 10 whole years? That's absolutely crazy. I find a letter in the archive. The letter was written by a lawyer and the lawyer sent the letter to Bill for him to check and make sure it was accurate. Now, the letter was from 1948, before these stories got told in 1949, May and December. It was 1948. They're, they're, they're on a train going to New York, uh, going to Washington, D.C., because they're going to be a memorial service for Fitz Mayo. And remember, Fitz had died several years before. And, uh, and the lawyer is going to be one of the guys speaking. So I don't know much about the lawyer, but, but he says, so we're on the train. This is what the letter says. We're on the train and I and we're talking about Fitz and you say Fitz didn't really have anything to do with the writing of the steps. And I said to you, well, that's a, that's an, it raises an interesting question. I've never heard anybody say how those 12 steps came about. And Bill Wilson says, well, we had these four steps. And he mentions four steps. Uh, and then he says, so I sat down and I thought about my own experience. I thought about my own experience in getting sober and I started, you know, taking those four things and kind of expanding them. And I came up with the 12 steps. Really, really, Bill Wilson's experience. Now, listen, um, if you read Bill's story, I mean, in my copy of the big book, there's the steps are numbered right in Bill's story. And oh, oh, by the way, that was Bill's story. That wasn't written in December of 1938 when he did the 12 steps. It was written in May of 1938, way earlier. So all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, okay. So the, the steps, I mean, they were influenced by the collective experience, but the steps basically were Bill Wilson's journey to, to sobriety. That was his understanding of what had happened to him. The guy sends this bill uh, several months later. He, he, he said, I dictated this thing to my secretary at, right, as soon as we got off the train that day. And I'm just getting back to it. And here it is. Tell me if this is correct. And they go back and always oh, says, and then they had some phone conversations with Bill to make sure it was correct. And Bill's supposed to sign off and send it back to the guy. So that's Bill Wilson's, I think, much truer story of where the 12 steps came from. I mean, this whole idea that, I mean, he, the other thing is he says, he says, he says the six steps broke down into the 12 steps. You go, please, I invite you to go get the, the six steps that are in the uh, A comes of age. And, and the 12 steps and see how much huge amount of new material there is there, huge amount. So then I thought, okay, okay, Wilson's telling these two stories and he didn't tell it for 10 or 11 years. And this is the story he told after nine years, maybe that one's not even true. Let me go back and see if anybody tell, talks about the six steps in contemporary documents. So what do we got? We got we got, we got Frank Amos goes out to check on Dr. Bob in February of 1938 for the Rockefeller people, and he talks about the seven things they're doing. There's a little correspondence with the six things, a little correspondence, not much though. And then of course, there's 30 stories other than Bill's story that got written for the book that was published in April of 1939. You would think if they were doing a six step word of mouth program, those guys would be talking about those six steps. Maybe they wouldn't be calling them the six steps, but they'd be talking about those things that they did that corresponded to those six steps. You pick up a red book, folks, or a reproduction of the red book, a first edition, first printing, and read those stories. Also, I've got excerpts in, in my book about, you know, people get sober. I love listening to people get sober because you always hit this point where something happened. Something happened. And if you read those stories in the book, something happened and then they started doing things differently. And uh, there are, there's no evidence in any of those 30 stories of the six steps. 
Now I know that there's a story by what's his name that showed up in the second edition where he says Dr. Bob took him through the sixth step, but that was published in 1955. That was almost 20 years after that supposedly happened when the urban legend of six steps had become deeply embedded in Alcoholics Anonymous. So, so there's no, not only is there, is there no evidence for the six steps, but there's really all this contrary evidence. Nobody of those 30 stories. Oh, Hank Parker also wrote a chapter called the Q&A chapter that he wanted to get in the book. <clears throat> it was uh, 94 questions and answers that he did. Um, the uh, typescripts in uh, GSO in New York City. And uh, I published that in, uh, in one of the appendices in one of my books. But it's just not, nothing there about it. Nothing there about it. And, and of course, Hank, there's also some writings where Hank's criticizing Bill, what he's writing in the book and saying it should be something like this. He's not talking about six steps. Okay. Let's, um, let's, let's move on. Thank you, Joe. Great question as usual. So we've just got some more questions here. So we're into the sort of the last uh, 20 minutes. I know that there's you're, you're happy to hang around for a bit as well, Bill, after the podcast is finished. But um, here's a question. This is from our great friend, David R., who's, um, who's, in, who's with us today. Bill says, you mentioned Ruth Hock. Did she type the manuscript? And what was the nature of her relationship with Bill W. and Hank Pankhurst? Good question. Thank you. Yeah, she was doing all the typing, although when the final manuscript got done, the one that they needed to, to have typed up so that they could have a multiple copy done in February of 1939, um, some of that was done by Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen, geez, good Lord. Um, mm -hmm. Names go, go right out of my head these days. Uh, Kathleen. Um, it's okay. Uh, Rudell, Kathleen Rudell. And she did some of the typing for that particular one, but just that was a one shot deal because they had to get it done quickly. Um, she was Hank's secretary. Uh, she was 25 when he hired her. She was uh, married with one child. She got divorced shortly after that. Uh, she and Hank started having an affair in late 1938. Not exactly sure when that started, but it was a, it was a big deal. Something that uh, certainly played itself out in later circumstances and also was something that Ruth acknowledged and, 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 uh, and, and said it happened. Um, but once, once Hank really wanted to divorce Kathleen, his wife, Kathleen, and, uh, and marry Ruth. But uh, once he started drinking, Ruth said there was no way that was ever going to happen. And, um, uh, and he wanted to keep Ruth as a secretary. Now, A is coming apart here as the book is being published. He wanted to keep Ruth as a secretary for this new job he had. And, uh, and Bill wanted her to go to New York City for the, 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 the Newark office wasn't going to be around anymore. Hank couldn't pay the rent. He wanted, so he moved, he moved the AA office down to Bessie Street in New York City. And, and Ruth went with him. And Hank always blamed uh, Bill for, uh, for screwing up his relationship with, uh, with Ruth Hawk. Uh, uh -huh. I don't believe there was anything going on between Bill and Ruth, as has been alleged, but... I don't know that for a fact. It's just my vibe that I get off of all the stuff that I, I read about them and between them. They, they exchanged a really nice set of letters in uh, 1954 before Bill wrote A Comes to the Age. And uh, I'm just not getting that kind of a vibe off their okay. relationship. Thank you very much. So um, David uh, also comes back with a follow-up. What happened to Works Publishing Inc? And did Bill W. or Hank make any money from the publishing of the big book? Super good question. Uh, the, the stock was, the, they, they gave the stock back in, in uh, April, I think in April of 1940. When Hank came up with this proposal, <clears throat> he was the big wheeler dealer. You're going to sell 200 shares of stock. There's going to be 600 shares of stock. You're going to sell 200 shares of stock at 25 bucks each. Hank's going to get 200 shares gifted to him as the, the managing editor and promoter. And Bill is going to get 200 shares as the author. So they did. Bill had 200 shares, Hank had 200 shares, and then they were going to sell the rest of this thing. So in fact, our literature was going to be owned by these two guys. I someplace in the book say, you know, if, if, if Hank was the serpent in the garden with this particular offer, Bill Wilson certainly took the apple and took a bite of it because he took 200 <laughs> shares. So, so they, they realized quickly that that was just not working. And especially after they got a guy with 200 shares, he owns a third of the company. 
and he's drunk. So they finally, Bill, cut, I didn't do the research, but there's all kinds of arguments about what went on. And, and, and Bill had stolen Hank's furniture from Newark and moved it to New York and hadn't paid Hank and blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, in 1940, I believe in April, they handed the, the, the 400 shares, 200 each, back to the Alcoholic Foundation, and they owned it ever since. Um, Works Publishing was around for the first, there were 16 printings of the first edition. Uh, and the first 14 were published by Works Publishing. The last two were published by AA World Services or whatever it was called in those days. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Um, Rick Rowe, um, another one of our friends from Toronto, it's uh, certainly Canada night, um, ask, can, can I ask you about the We Agnostic chapter? What is the purpose of this chapter? Is it to get people um, who have an agnostic temperament so that we don't take a position to be religious nuts? Or is it on the flip side of being an atheist? I've struggled with that chapter mightily myself. <clears throat> and uh, Bill Wilson, in one of his letters to Dr. Bob, uh, says, uh, you know, he really thinks it's too preachy. It's still too preachy. Good Lord, I can't imagine how much more preachy it could be than it is. Because uh, I got the impression that he that he he, he dialed it back from being preachy, you know. But uh, there's a, there's an interesting thing about this. I think there's a lot of confusion in Alcoholics Anonymous today. Did I just freeze up? No, you're good. Okay. Uh, there's a there's a lot of lot of uh, misunderstanding, I think, about that chapter in AA today because of this as we understand them thing, the Jimmy Burwell thing. You know, where you can always go with group of drunks. You know, there's there's nothing about there's nothing about group of drunks in that thing. There's nothing about a deist God in that thing. You need to understand, this is my, my opinion. This is when I read this book, that chapter, the only way I can make sense out of what the words say, what the black part of those, that chapter is, <laughs> is to understand two presumptions that Bill Wilson had that aren't explicitly said because everybody who was in his zone, in his context, in his culture, just presumed those two things. Number one presumption that you need to you need to get a firm grip on if you're going to read that chapter. Number one presumption: God equals spiritual. Spiritual equals God. There's no other way to get a vital spiritual experience unless you believe in God. No way. That's it. Presumption number one. Presumption number two. Unstated. Presumption number two. Oh, you know that God you got to believe in to get a spiritual experience? That God is a providential God. A God, a God of Abraham, a God you can pray to and get help from. So if you're a deist, if you think God created the world and went away and doesn't pay any attention to human beings anymore, we can't, we're not talking about that kind of God. That kind of God doesn't work. Spinoza's kind of God doesn't work. Can't do that because, because he's not responsive to prayer. The only God that works, according to the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, is a providential God, an Abrahamic God, a God you can pray to and expect to get help from and destroy and and Hank and Bill, uh, their big argument was over this 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 concept of God. Um, Hank was Hank was much more in the in the uh, in the deist zone, you know that 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 uh, that that he didn't Hank does not seem to have believed in any way, shape, form, or manner in a God you can pray to and get help from. But it's a central tenet of Alcoholics Anonymous in that book, the way it's written today. And if you try and make it more liberal. You know, get a little bit more as we understand them, you know. I mean, I, I remember, always remember hearing a tape of a woman who, who when she first came in, took the Pace, there's Pace Moving Company, P-A-C-E. So she was taking the Pace Moving Trucks. Anytime she saw them in the street, those were, those were her higher powers because it was positive attitude changes everything. That was her higher power. You know, no, that's not what the book is talking about. The book is talking about spiritual equals God, God equals spiritual. And by the way, we're talking about a providential God and nothing else. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Peggy asks, is it a true chain of events that led to the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous as was initiated by the psychologist Carl Jung? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, Jung supposedly got rolling hazards over. There's some controversy about how that happened and when that happened, but I don't doubt that that happened. Roland comes back and gets involved in the Oxford group. 
Oxford group, he gets he he takes Abby under his wing, gets him out of gets him out of trouble up in Vermont, brings him down to New York, puts him in in the uh, in the, the 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 church, Sam Shoemaker's church, where he's staying in in a, in a shelter there. Yeah, and that Abby leads the bill, Bill leads the Bob. They write a book, the whole thing happens. Sure, I mean you can you can certainly follow that that train of thought. Uh, and and you know I got to say one thing. There's, you know, talking about all the changes that happen, people just don't pay attention. The first version of There is a Solution, where he tells that story about Roland Hazard and, and Dr. Carl Jung. Um, now, famously in our book today, it says, Jung says that you need a vital spiritual experience. But in the first version that Bill Wilson wrote and typed of that, 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 that chapter, it says you, that Jung said to, to, to Roland Hazard, you need to have a vital religious experience, a vital right. religious experience. Now, quite frankly, if that, had, if that had ended up in the 1939 April 10th book, uh, I would not be here talking to you today. Because I was not about having a, a vital religious experience. I, 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 I live under, under a, a very huge spiritual understanding umbrella. And, uh, and it goes way beyond <clears throat> any religious concepts. So, so Bill, Bill was responsible then for that particular change. We don't know who. I know. Okay. I, I think. I think. I think. I think Hank Parker's came along with a two by four and beat him upside the head until he changed it. To tell you the truth. Okay. No proof of that. Just speculation on my part. Hey, I wonder how much that two before is worth nowadays. Wow. Maybe more than the big book. Max S asks a really good question. I mean, actually, this is a great question, Max. Why didn't Bill write to employers? Well, I think I think he, I think Hank insisted that he wanted to do that. I mean, he also Hank uh, Bill also admits that that Hank was really you know Hank was a was a real businessman. I'm, Bill was a stock speculator. That's what he was. He was a stock. He was you know he was a stock speculator. He wasn't a broker. He was a speculator. But mm -hmm. Hank had had big jobs. He had a lot of people working for him, and uh, and and Bill thought it was appropriate that he do that. Now, of course, there's you know and you know people say well Hank didn't. Uh, Hank didn't write that chapter. I've seen a, I've seen a letter at Stepping Stones where somebody actually wrote Bill Wilson and said, "Did Hank write?" And he says, "Yes, Hank Parker wrote that chapter." But if you need any more proof than that, it's the only chapter in the big book that doesn't have the word "God" in it. What what better testimony do you need than the fact that that was not a Bill Wilson chapter and that was a Hank Parker's chapter? It's the only chapter in the big book without the word "God" in it. There's only a couple of mentions of spiritual, and the spiritual mentions all come from some doctor. So, you know, it's yeah okay okay um this just leads me on we've had um a few comments about this over while we've been doing here's tom with the weather which by the way we have a facebook page just so if you want to join the facebook page you can get in touch with some of the uh, all the upcoming guests that we've got next week we've got um bill wigmore uh, the, with the two-way prayer, he's going to be a special guest on here next week. So please come along. That's at the same time, same back channel next uh, next week on the podcast. Just a little ad break, but um, just going back to to Bill here, mate. Um, do you think that the two employers and two wives, those chapters and some of the phraseology in the big book, is in need of change? And if so, would what kind of effect would that have on the on the fellowship? Your opinion, and this is your opinion. I have an opinion. Do um, you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the big book is 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 profoundly outdated, and uh, there was a time where I thought we should rewrite the book. You know, the book should be cleaned up. There's language, the blah blah, all that stuff. I I don't believe that anymore. I mean, I really don't believe that anymore. Not. Not only that, it, it would be impossible to do because my understanding of the GSO uh, restrictions on changes to the first 164 pages is that if you want to change one comma, you need two thirds of the groups in Alcoholics Anonymous to vote positively for it. So that's worse That's worse than the filibuster in the Senate for Christ's sake. Oh my but God. It's never going to happen. I mean, it's never, 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 never going to happen. So I think I think the book is important to be to be kept exactly the way it is. I'm good with that. But but as I say with real regularity, if we get to 2039, 100 years after the publication of that book, and Alcoholics Anonymous hasn't written a new book, a new book, then shame on Alcoholics Anonymous. We need a new book that has real med updated medical information. 
We need a new book that when we talk about two wives and the family afterwards, talks about Al-Anon in a really serious, practical and helpful way. We need a book that when we talk about two employers, we're not talking about 1938 work situations and call corporate cultures. We gotta be talking about EIPs and blah, 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 all that other stuff. When we talk about a vision for you, we don't need to be just talking about what happened in Akron in 1938. We can be talking about what happened worldwide. We need a new book. We need a book that opens up the spiritual umbrella as wide as it could possibly be so that people can see an entryway into Alcoholics Anonymous. Recently, we got that, what, the, the God Word or whatever. There's some new pamphlet out that, that came out. Did a good job on that. Did a really, really good job on that. So I think, yeah, I think we need a new book. I think we need a new book by God at the latest, April of 19, 2039. And my suggestion is that the title for that book should be More Has Been Revealed. I'll go with that. You're going to get a copyright on that, mate. Great. Go for it. Ah, Great. Yeah. I mean, just for the fact that the English language or whatever language changes, it's always fluid, is that obviously, you know, it's already things like John Barleycorn and stuff have no relevance to the modern. So the modern English language has changed a, a, a million times since 100 years ago. It's changed. It's basically what we're speaking today would almost be unrecognisable from 100 years ago. So by that, you know, by that, just by looking at it like that, I think it's certainly... They do need to look at it, but that's, again, my opinion. That's a really good answer. I really appreciate that. So a um, few more questions here. Um, from Mike Stacy, and Mike's always one to put this one up, and this is going to come to a question. I've got a few later. Would you subscribe to the premise that the big book was divinely inspired or some kind of metaphysical download, if you will? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. I mean, I can elaborate, David, if you want, but no, I mean, I, again, I, I, I said I, I live in a world without any supernatural elements. And uh, yeah. I mean, uh, inspired is one of those loaded words, you know, it, it, it's a contaminated word. I mean, you want to say the book's inspired. We're talking about Jesus coming down and whispering in Bill's left ear. You know, I'm not going there. No. OK. Jennifer asked a really good question. What kind of response do you and you, and I asked you this today, have, have you been hit over the head with the big book a few times since you published this book? What's been the response? Well, I haven't had a lot of negative response, but I'm sure that there is negative response out there. Uh, I know that people think that I'm uh, bad mouthing Bill Wilson because I, I, I say that he didn't tell true stories. I mean, there are some people say, are you calling Bill Wilson a liar? Well, no, I'm not calling Bill Wilson a liar. Bill Wilson is one of the most important men in my lives. You know, I mean, he's he's a guy who saved my life. I'm, I'm glad he wasn't telling those complicated, messy stories that nobody could understand what the hell the point was. So uh, there's that. And I and of course, there's the, the whole uh, revelation, if you will, about the lack of effort and the real negative pushback uh, that came out of Ohio. I'm sure the Ohio people aren't happy about this. There's been a couple of couple of negative reviews on Amazon that kind of touch on that. But in general, you know, you know, not only do they have nothing to do with the first 164 pages, there's there's all the stories in the back, right? And and a couple of those guys actually wrote those stories. But more than half of those stories weren't written by people from Akron because they they they, they didn't want to have anything to do with this this project this money grubbing project that this snake oil salesman bill wilson from new york city had they had nothing to do with it and bob is getting pressure from his sponsor bill wilson about i need those stories give me the stories bill wilson goes out and he gets himself uh, i mean uh, bob, bob goes out and sobers up a, a newspaper man named jim scott and he gets jim scott to go and have coffee with these guys and have him tell his story and he goes back to his house and he typed, Jim Scott types up the stories for this guy and for that guy and for this guy and for that guy, because those guys wouldn't write stories for the book. They were not on board with the book project. Okay. So at this stage, we're sort of running out now. There's a couple of questions I will want to ask, but I want to bring in uh, Jim W. Uh, Jim W is a, an AA historian of some note. Um, he's going to be talking to us from his palace in Mexico. Um, and Jim, do you want to, I know you have some comments that you'd like to come in or just a couple of questions you'd like to make, it's really, would love to hear from you. So I'm asking you to unmute, Jim. 
There you go. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, David. And uh, always good to be uh, be in a meeting with Bill. Uh, I'm not sure if I was his number one fan, but uh, you know, I did fly up from Cancun, Mexico, to uh, to get a signed uh, book on the day that he launched in November of 2019. And I also have the ebook and the audio book, you know. So uh, I, I participate uh, on the AA History Lovers Facebook page. And uh, a lot of what has been said today comes up uh, as topics. You know, did uh, who wrote uh, to employers and who wrote, you know, to wives? And, and some of the questions are very nitpicky. Uh, some of the questions, and some of the answers um, show that the division between Akron and New York is still alive and well. Um, you know, uh, the first uh, serious history by Ernie, Ernie Kurtz, who, you know, uh, Bill says was, uh, you know, one of his, his big mentor. You know, we are, we are storytellers and our, our, our fellowship has survived on storytelling uh, all these years. And now all of a sudden somebody comes up with some facts that say that some of those stories may not be historically accurate. And there is, you know, we all have, are looking for confirmation bias. You know, my sponsor told me, you know, this guy with 60 years of sobriety said this, so it must be true. It's good enough for me. You know, I don't need some new historian. I mean, these, these things are, are, they come up on the page. And then of course, the majority of people are just grateful, you know, to have this new information, this new understanding uh, of the writing of the big book. And, uh, you know, like I say, some of the things, what does this word mean and when did this happen, uh, people ask about, but they always, they, they also do, and Bill uh, talked about this, you know, they want to know, you know, are you bad mouthing Bill, you know, you're calling him a liar, uh, but uh, the, the big thing is, is that uh, I, I think the majority of people trust this book, you know, uh, because of the footnotes, because of the research, the seriousness with which it was written, and uh, it, it's well respected. And uh, if any, uh, you know, two things have come out to change the direction of AA in the in this virus epic, it's been Zoom and the writing of the big book. You know, so uh, those things, these things come up, and they bring that uh, they bring a new vision to the people of AA. And it's not like, okay, now I can't believe what the big book says. You know, um, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. Uh, it gives a new dimension. To me, it makes people uh, more real, more real, more like me and more relatable. Hmm. So I don't want to, don't want to babble on, but this has been a great presentation as always, uh, always glad to be, uh, I, and by the way, I would not consider myself a, 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 an historian. Uh, I'm just a kind of a cut and paste guy, you know, okay. just an amateur guy standing on the shoulders of giants like Bill. Thank you. That's wonderful. I'll, I'll call you the cut and paste guy from now on, okay? I won't do any of those fancy introductions, mate. That's wonderful. But you did touch on a point there, and it's something that we've spoke about before. Do you think, just a question for both of you, I guess, is... um. Is there a danger that we deify Bill W, that we've turned, we're turning him into this golden figure, this, this whole sort of this saint? Do you think that that's happening? And do you think there's a danger in that? Well, I, I think it did happen. You know, I, there's the old famous, uh, what's it called? The pillar letter, Bill, uh, you know, where somebody was, I think it was a Chicago, somebody from Chicago wrote to Bill and, you know, complained to him. I don't know what it was about, but some of Bill's peccadillos, you know, and, uh, and Bill wrote this letter back to him and said, Hey, you know, I have never claimed to be a saint. And, uh, you know, if you have put me up on a pedestal, you know, that's your problem. And, uh, but I, I, yeah, there is, there is a danger in saying, uh, that the big book 
is divinely inspired and that Bill Wilson is deified. Uh, th th there's a real, um, I, I think there's a real danger in that because it makes, uh, it makes the path narrower and it's not the broad highway that we're looking for. Mm. I, I'm sorry, Bill, you, you can answer Bill, this probably no, better. That's than... a great response, Bill. No, that's, that, that's really, you know, I say with some regularity though, and, and people feed it back to me, people get this, Jim is, 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 is exactly saying this. The stories that Bill Wilson told about early A history, the flying blind period, which is what I'm writing about here, uh, is, it's, it's a miraculous story how AA came about, a miraculous story. I gotta tell you, I think the, the real human, real personable story that's told in my book is way, way, way more miraculous than we ever, ever got to that book on April 10th, 1939. If there's a, there, there are, there's, there's, I told you, there's all these places where A is just teetering on the edge and people just, until I did this research and put this package together, people didn't even know about half of these things. I mean, that there was these places mm -hmm. where A could have gone completely off the rails. And for one reason or another, on a human level, things happen, you know? Bill didn't drink that day. He mm. went. He went to Newark. He didn't drink that day. You know, big deal. Big deal. Much more miraculous story, in my opinion. Much more inspiring story. You talk about inspired. Now I'm talking inspired in a different way. It inspires me when I read this story. When I put this story together, I was like, AA became more important. AA became more, more real to me. It became more human to me. It became more present to me it's like i can i can relate to these guys i can relate to these guys these guys are you know you know hank's having an affair with you mm. know with, with help and and his wife threw, hank got thrown out of his house in, in early january in 1939 he spends 10 weeks living with the wilson's over in brooklyn because kathleen's throwing him up i love those kind of stories man i i know those i know who those guys i know who i know who these guys are you know i'm not mm. sure about all those stories that i read and uh the blow smoke at Bill Wilson stories. Yeah, I think it's a big danger. It's a big danger. We all have clay feet. You may have golden heads, as it says in the Bible, but when you look at the statue and you get to the bottom, the feet are made of clay. Great. Okay, so I'm just going to ask you um, just a couple of personal questions just on your take. And I know we've had a couple of interesting questions. Can you give me your concept of a higher power? What is God? Who is God? Do you have a God? What's your spiritual, what's your particular spiritual bent? Well, as I said, I believe in a very large umbrella of spirituality. <clears throat> I haven't had any uh, supernatural elements in my life for 55 years. That means no angels or devils, no ghosts or goblins, no gods or goddesses, no, uh, no magic spells, no spirit world of any kind. And it's been working really, really well for me. Now, I struggled a lot when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous with that stuff. Um, but so knowing that, it shocks a lot of people to say, if you ask me what step I'm working on, I'm going to tell you three. Right. That's, what I'm, that's what I'm working on today is step three. Oh, really? Oh, really? You don't believe in God? How can you do that? Um, I've been through a lot of a lot of different iterations in 39 years with my third step. I mean, the first, I spent the first six or seven years just arguing at meetings against God. I finally stopped doing that. I realized that wasn't the point. That wasn't the point. It took me six or seven years to realize that wasn't the point. The point was that there were people who were actually turning things over, who they were turning it over to vary for all these guys that I admired who were actually doing that thing and the lives they were leading because they were, they were enjoying their lives because of that. So I realized that what I needed to do was to uh, just uh, let it go. So I worked on letting it go for a, a, just years and years and years. Let it go. Just let it go. Um, my Buddhist teacher a couple of years ago gave me a book and I read the book. I hated the book she gave me. It was very Tibetan. I don't like Tibetan Buddhism. And, uh, but there was one takeaway from that book and the guy in the book talked about not letting it go, but letting it be. And that was really, that was another one of those scales fell from my eyes. I realized that when I let things go, first of all, I start off with the proposition that it's mine to begin with and I'm the one letting it go. And I've always got this little thread still going to it that I can yank it back at any time. 
Whereas if I'm just letting it be, it's got nothing to do with me whatsoever, nothing whatsoever. And, uh, and as I, I told you, uh, David and Ann, I, I, I get on my knees every morning. I get on my knees every night. I have a whole bunch of affirmations I do. And for honest, I think maybe 20 years, I opened up my, my morning affirmation by saying, uh, my, you know, good morning to this day. And, and uh, uh, I, I want to stay sober today. I'm glad I stayed sober yesterday. I want to stay sober today with the help of our fellowship and the 12 steps, our spiritual program of action. And then I would say, welcome to everything that this day holds for me personally. Personally, I consider that a perfect third step prayer. Hmm. Welcome to this day and to everything that this day holds for me personally. Welcome. So I was doing that for like 20 years. And I have always told the story of myself. I would be on my knees. I'd go upstairs. I always shave after I get on my knees. And I would cut myself on occasion. And I'd start cursing and swearing. No welcome there. No welcome at all. You know, be like. So I, I, I a couple of probably actually it was it was in October. I realized how 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 hip, hypocritical that was for me, for me, because I was saying it on my knees every single morning. So I, I made a resolution uh, then that, that anytime I had anything that was uh, annoying or, or difficult or painful, I would say welcome. I would just say welcome out loud. I would say welcome out loud. And that's my my work on the third step today is that when whatever happens, when anything happens, especially if it pisses me off or uh, or just annoys me um you know they trying to get tissues out of the paper box and then you know you get 16 of them rather than one you know it pisses me off i said well welcome, <laughs> welcome 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 i can't remember things i'm getting old i say welcome i almost you know my balance isn't that good anymore i say welcome um just it, I'm, I'm doing the welcome thing and i'm saying welcome out loud anywhere from 10 to 30 times a day and that's my practice of the third step. I want to be welcoming to anything. I was at a meeting the other night where a guy, they, they, people do this third step. Oh, yeah. Do with me what thou wilt. And I said, you know, you say that every morning and you say you love it. But from the time you get up off your knees until you go to the door, it doesn't mean anything in the real world. And my welcome didn't mean anything in the real world until really recently. So I've been I've been doing that. Um I don't have a concept of God to anybody else. I, I, I believe in reality with a capital R if you want to push me in that direction. That's right. I get it. I'm down with it. Thank you very much. I'm um, just a quick one. I'm, I'm sorry. I've, I've been remiss. Dano B's asked a couple of questions. So I'm just going to give one question. Dano asked, can you give us a brief timeline of November the 11th to December the 14th, the dates that Ebby saw Bill at home and hospital twice? Does that make sense? Yeah, there's, Tanner, there's not a lot of real concrete evidence on that. You know, we don't really know when Ebby came. As I said, uh, Bill said late November, Lois said December. And, uh, but we know that Bill was drinking on Armistice Day. That was, that was the day he fell off the wagon. So that was November 11th. So Ebby would have come sometime between November 11th and December 12th when he entered Towns Hospital. But what happened in between then, as far as any kind of accurate timeline, it's just all basically uh, uh, basically speculation. And there's contradictory evidence. Uh, so, so no, I, I, I can't, can't give, you know, people, people go crazy arguing over what books did Ebby bring them? And did Ebby bring the books? Or did Seba Graves bring the books? Or just like, no, no, no. OK, fine. Okay, so listen, we've come to the end. I think that's uh, an amazing. I'm going to ask my final question as we do every week. Um, and this week, there's just going to be a little stipulation on this. You can't, your answer can't be the big book. Okay, it goes like this. So <laughs> anything, anything but <laughs> AA literature. Okay, um, so sales have for the book have been phenomenal in fact you've become a millionaire overnight amazon's gone crazy all those all the pl pl platforms and you've just become super rich so you decide once and for all to pack in the whole sort of book selling thing and you buy a super yacht and you sail off in down the atlantic down around the coast of south Af south america up into the south pacific somewhere off the coast of fiji with your super yacht with all your worldly possessions on board all your favorite stuff you strike a submerged coral reef and the super yacht starts to sink. You go, I'm going to get off. So you get all your friends and family, toss them overboard, and they swim to a nearby deserted isle. The ship's rapidly sinking, and all you've got time is to grab a plastic bag and you a book from the bookcase. You chuck the book in the bag, you dive overboard, swim 
to the deserted island and await rescue with this one book that you've got. What's the book? Who's it by and why? Hmm. I haven't seen this program before, so I didn't know that question was coming. So uh, um, I, uh, with a whole bunch of thought, I probably come up with a different answer. But the first thing that came to mind as I could see where you were going with this thing was a book called Maps of Time by David Christian. Uh, Sorry, say that again. Maps of Time by David Christian. Okay. David Christian is uh, currently teaching in Australia. Um, he invented a discipline called Big History in 1989. And that book covers history. It's a historical account from the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago up to the present. Uh, David Christian has done uh, teaching company. I've read that book three times. He's done teaching company lectures. There's 48 lectures on the book, uh, and I've watched those seven times. Um, it's uh, it's it's just uh, it's just the it's just you know we have such limited perspective on who mm. we are and how it all works. And, and you know, the, the science is changing all the time. I mean, the, the story we got at the moment is, is obviously going to change, but it's the story we got. This is the story that this guy's got on how this thing works. And I was most impressed with the fact that um, understanding how recently our species, mm. uh, Homo sapiens, has emerged 250,000 years ago, perhaps, perhaps mm. 300,000 years ago. And we've been, mm. you know, we've been, we were tribal communal people. I mean, that's a, we, we weren't this autonomous, you know, everybody, every man for himself, individuality. I mean, hell, that didn't even start until agriculture started 10,000 years ago. Before that, we were tribal people, and that's in our DNA. And quite frankly, I think my tribe is Alcoholics Anonymous. That's where my tribe is, man. I feel really comfortable in Alcoholics mm. Anonymous, even when those people are subbing Jesus down my throat. I'm, 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 I'm hanging in there, you know, because it's my tribe, and that's how we work. And that's how we go. But Christian just did a fabulous, fabulous job of, uh, of rubbing my nose in uh, the insignificance of us as a species and me as an individual. So it, it's basically a history of time since the Big Bang right up to from stardust, literally from the Big Bang stardust to who we are today, that it's a journey. That, that, wow. Wow. I think I might check that out. That sounds like a fantastic book. Thank you. That's a quite a big book to swim all that way, though. Do you think you could have got a lighter one, maybe? <laughs> that would have dragged me down a bit, mate, you know? If, if I had to pick a lighter one, it would probably be uh, Buddhism Without Beliefs by, uh, by uh, right. who wrote Buddhism Without Beliefs, Joe? Hold on. There you go, Joe. Uh, you have to... Roger. Yeah. Oops. No, no, no. Roger. I, no, it's not a Roger. I've done two retreats with him. Good Lord. Anyhow, there's a book called Buddhism. We'll Google it. It's a little tiny book. It's a real little book. And it's uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful book on uh, on uh, on Buddhism and uh, being present, trying to be present, trying to confront the reality of the fact that we're all going to die. Like, especially me. I'm, I'm going to die. I know you're going to die, but I'm, I'm a little uncertain about me dying, you know? <laughs> Forget you, mate. I'm going to die. Yeah. What are you on about? Yeah, it's Stephen. I don't care about you. Stephen anyway, Bachelor. listen, Stephen, yeah, stop this. That, that's stop. the Roger I was thinking of. Stephen Batchelor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stephen Batchelor is a fantastic yeah. Buddhist teacher, in my opinion, and his most accessible and easy to read book is, is Buddhism Without Beliefs. Well, we are we are going to be doing a big thing on Buddhism in a month or so, so hang hang around for that. That's we're having a Buddhism debate actually on uh, whether Buddhism and the Twelve Steps is compatible. So come along. That'll be I think that's going to be in May or June. So that'll be a, a debate as well. So you're all invited. So anyway, that's it for this week. Thank you very much, Bill. So details of his book are in the chat. Please buy his book. It's uh, it's highly recommended. Um, it's a lot of work. 11 years in the making. That's a hell of an effort, mate. And congratulations on its success. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you again to my mate Joe C in Toronto, who who kindly uh, got us in touch and got you on here. I'm really grateful for that. Also very grateful to Anne Kay, who, as usual, has done a sterling job in uh, sorting us out. She's a mar marvellous producer. And, Bill, thank you so much, mate. It's been awesome. I know you're going to hang around for a little bit afterwards. Anyone's got some questions as well for just off the record. I'm going to stop recording. We'll see you next week. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.